All right, folks, welcome back. If you've joined us for our first two sessions, this is session three. Uh, I'm Bill Real. Uh, this is Jacob Hansen uh, along for the ride again. So this will be a lot of fun. Uh, the first session we talked about uh, morality. The second session we discussed, uh, at least in part, faith crises. And here we are for session number three. And uh, today we're going to talk about testimony, testimony in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the restored gospel, and how one can arrive at testimony and how one can know that that testimony has um, the best chance of being true versus other conclusions that could be drawn. And so I wonder, Jacob, if you'd start us off, because when you framed this as a topic to go into you you shared with me that you've got um, the things that you depend on to kind of help you come up with what you see as an accurate, truthful, the best we can do. Again, we're all sort of guessing at it, right? The, the accurate, truthful way to arrive at knowing that the way you framed it in your mind about what's true and what isn't uh, can be depended on. And so I wonder if you could start us off by kind of running us through that formula helping people to understand what are the components of how you get to testimony and let's go from there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first of all, when we're talking about testimony, it's also important to kind of pull back a little bit and, and set up, what are we talking about here? Um, because really what we're talking about is we're talking about knowledge. We're talking about how you know things, right? People go up and they bear what they know. They say that I know the church is true. Right. And so one of the things that a person needs to first ask is how do you know anything? Like, how do you know what you know? And what a lot of people don't realize is that that is the epistemological question. That is the, the, there's an entire philosophical field known as epistemology that explores the nature of knowledge and how do we know what we know? Um, so it's actually a much deeper thing than a lot of people realize. Um, and so you have to kind of dig down into, you know, what does it mean to know things and, um, and then explore what, you know, what are the different ways that we know things or that we say that we have any knowledge of anything. Um, and I actually wanted to build, start off kind of and explore this together, right? So that we can both kind of move through this conversation in a way where, um, we both are human beings who are being presented with, um, we both got to try and attain knowledge. Would you agree? Like we're, we're both trying to acquire what we know and the nature of reality. Is that, is that fair to say? Yep. Sure. I, that I want to know reality as best I can. And I want to know as much of it as I can. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so with those slides that I have, some of those are the ones that, that uh, if we could pull those up, that I think will, will help us here. So I, I like to kind of get rid of any presuppositions here. One thing that um, I think people may have gotten the impression of in the last conversation is that, that I presuppose the existence of God, that I operate from a theistic presuppositionalist uh, standpoint, and I don't. I do not presuppose the existence of God. I believe you can arrive at a, at a belief and or knowledge of God uh, through particular sort of reasonings that you can do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you and I, as human beings, we're here and we both agree that we exist and that outside of us exists this thing that we call reality. Is that is that the way that you view the picture? I just want to kind of walk through this to see where we agree and where we disagree. So um, there are possibilities that that's not true. For instance, being in a simulation, for example. Yeah. But yeah, that's I will, I will, I, I want to in my world and I pretend at least, and I agree that it's the most rational perspective that we are real, we do exist, and there is a reality to uh, get closer to. Okay, cool. And so, so that reality, what, what I'll call that reality is, I, when I use the word truth, that something is true, yeah. what I'm saying is, is that it, it pertains to reality, right? Like it is in accordance with reality. It's something that actually exists. Okay. So if you go in there to the second slide, we start to get to this issue of, of perception, right? And I think maybe this is where there was a disconnect in our last conversation was when we're talking about, you know, is there an objective reality out there? 
I think, and this is my my take on this, is that we probably both agree on that, or at least we we will presuppose that a reality exists outside of ourselves. Yeah. But what maybe you're saying is is that it's not objective because our experience of reality has to be filtered through ourself. So all that we have is our subjective perception of reality. Is that is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I'll go with that for the moment. Again, I, I, this, you're putting this to me in the right now, and I would want to think these things through before I have to be held to it. But for the conversation's yeah. sake, yes, and, and, and fair enough. You know, you can say tentatively, like, yeah, that yeah. that seems okay. But obviously, uh, and I'm not trying to trap you here. I just want to. No, no, yeah, there may be flaws in thinking that not having a ton of background in philosophy, I may not see my own blind spots. Right? I yeah, that's I. fine. Yeah, no, and 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 just so you know, and just so everyone knows, I'm approaching this conversation with a lot of epistemic humility. Okay, yeah. these are these are very deep philosophical questions, yeah. but this is the model upon which I think I operate, and I think most people operate. Right, um, that there exists outside of us this reality, but that we perceive this reality through witnesses. For instance, our eyeballs. Our yeah. eyeballs act as a witness to what is out there. But as you and I know, and everyone knows, your eyeballs can actually deceive you, right? Like you could actually be not seeing what's actually there. Um, and so we have, so the question is, is we have these things that witness to us what is real. And then we, it processes through us to color the way that we perceive the world, the the, the way that we see the world, okay? And so when we're dealing with epistemology or the the how do we know things th there becomes this question is, is okay well what are the legitimate sort of senses or witnesses that we can take in that uh that give us an accurate picture of the nature of reality itself okay now if you go to the next slide um we get into, this is another thing is the language. There's some language issues here when we talk about knowledge, right? Um, one thing is, is that if you say that you know something, and, and I'm going to talk right now about rational knowledge, because I think that's what most people are talking about when they're talking about knowledge. They're talking about things that you can know, rationally speaking, right? The problem is, is that and this is kind of the bold assertion of a philosopher like um, Rene Descartes, is that there's very, very few things to almost nothing that you actually have 100% epistemological certainty about, okay? Like, I, I can say, yeah, I know Bill's right here. Like, I can see him, but I'm only 99.999% confident of that because I could be living in a matrix. Correct. You know what I'm saying? Right. So what we have here is knowledge. When, when someone says that they know something, what they're saying is, is that there's a certain level of confidence that they've reached to where they no longer say, I believe so, or I think Bill is here talking to me. They say, I know it. So to say that you know something is just to say that you are highly, 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 highly confident that that thing is the way that it is. Okay. Now that is if you're talking about sort of what we'll call rational knowledge, but there, and I, I serve my mission in Argentina, so I speak Spanish and anyone who speaks Spanish knows there's actually two different words in, in Spanish for to know things. And this is also, I believe true in Latin and Greek as well as there's different sort of ways of knowing things linguistically. And there's the word saber, which is to know something sort of rationally or cognitively. And then there's conocer. Now, conocer, they'll say it's kind of like to be familiar with something, right? It's to know it like, like experientially, right? There's a difference between maybe knowing about love, like I could write a really good philosophical essay about love, and then knowing love because you've experienced love. Does that make sense, Bill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just want to make sure you're following along. Yeah. So, so... We have to make sure that we recognize that there's different sort of categories of knowledge that, that human beings talk about linguistically when they're talking about knowledge, okay? So the question becomes, okay, but what on what basis can you say that you 
have a, a higher or lower level of confidence in any given proposition that's out there, right? Um, and that's where I go to um, sort of this idea of witnesses to the truth, okay? That help us to approximate what is and is not true, okay? So if you go to the next slide, slide four, if I, if I, let's say that somebody comes up to me, because you, you're, you and I both kind of agree that, well, I guess I'm, I'm going to, at least rationally speaking, you can't directly contact the external reality that's out there. Right. Um, We're all making our best guess at it. Sure. Yeah. Cause it's being given to us through witnesses that are fallible ultimately, right? Like my eyes even, um, so if I always say, it's kind of like, imagine that you were the judge, the guy in the tie there, uh, but you have these witnesses that are talk, telling you about what's going on in the outside world, right? So if you have a single person come to you as a judge and say, hey, I saw this person run a red light, you'll have a level of confidence that that's true depending on the person and their reliability. But there is a, um, so there's this level of confidence that you get, but it's not um it's not perfect. It's not, you know, just because one person says something doesn't mean that it's the case. But if you go, if you go down to the next slide um, and you have five witnesses who all come in and say, hey, we all saw her run the red light, your confidence continues to go up. Also, Especially if those five don't know each other, or they're not connected or they're not in the vehicle that got hit by you know, totally. Yes, absolutely. Okay. If these things are in, in independent spheres. Yeah. Absolutely. So now if we go down to the next slide, um, we get into, um, but then you get the problem of what if witnesses conflict? <laughs> you know what I mean? What if one person says that the car was green, the other person says that the car was red. And, and so suddenly the level of confidence in a given uh, proposition based on the witnesses that you receive, if they're conflicting, the level of confidence gets, gets changed by this, right? So the question becomes, well, what are the witnesses to reality, right? Like we've already talked about our eyes, for instance, we could call that sort of sensory data is, is a, is a witness to the truth, uh, and, and to the nature of reality. But if you come down here to the next one, um, number seven, this is sort of, so I asked myself a question, um, how do I know anything? And I began to explore, how people justify what they say they know or have any confidence in at all. And I came up with what I call the five witness model or the collective witness model of epistemology. And this is kind of my thing. And it's not, just so everyone knows, this isn't like unique to me. I didn't invent this per se. All of th this is a, this is a, others have, have talked about this, haven't maybe coined this exact term for it. But um, you have things like, uh, let's just start on the far right there, authority. So, Bill, how do you know that there are moons surrounding planets in another galaxy? Right. I have to trust the experts who have shown themselves over time to be accurate and competent uh, at the things that they claim. Yes, absolutely. So that is, that is authority. We appeal to authority and it is legitimate and rational to appeal to authority when an authority has shown themselves to be trustworthy over time. But that is one witness because we all know that authorities also are fallible, right? And so just because someone is an expert, we, we don't need to abandon all of the rest of the, the, the epistemological tools that we have, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So now as we go to, now let's talk about reason, okay? Reason is another way that we can come to know the truth of something. Uh, the only caveat, and, and when I talk about reason, I'm talking about premises. I'm basically talking about logic. A plus B equals AB. You know what I'm saying? We got to pause there for a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Only because logic and reason are actually very different things. And right. so logic... Um, do you mind if I put a slide up and just explain yeah, just yeah. to make sure yeah, we're I, I want the audience to be on the same page. So let me sneak over here. Uh, logic, for instance, um, is in both of these statements. Elizabeth owns either a Honda or a Saturn. Elizabeth does not own a Honda. Therefore, Elizabeth owns a Saturn. 
Uh -huh. Also, logic is available in all toasters are items made of gold. All items made of gold are time travel devices. Therefore, all toasters are time travel devices. But yes. but the first, but the second one's not reasonable. And what reason requires of us is to go into our premises and to be able to establish that our way of getting to our conclusion is the least inferential versus the other uh, argumentation that someone else is presenting. So mm -hmm. while the second statement is logical, it isn't reasonable. And those two are very different things. And so I just want to, if, if you want to do that, that's fine. But I would yeah. want you not to call reason, logic reason. I would want you to just be clear that we're talking about logic only. And that yes. how, how, so for instance, reason would say, we all, you know, we, we can do the science. We know toasters aren't made of gold, at least most of them. Maybe somebody out there has one, but I highly doubt that. So uh, all items are made of gold or time travel devices. We can, again, show that that's unreasonable. It requires too much inference, inference. too much conjecture, too many yeah, there's, there, there's not enough data there, right? It's right. the data. The data says, otherwise. no, there's plenty of data there. We know that those statements are false. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying is that is that the, the data actually can adjudicate the question. So right. when I'm talking about so so and there's two different things there to to when you're talking about reason, maybe I'm talking about logic itself. Yeah. Because logic is sort of the is it coherent, right? But just because something is coherent, as you've already shown in that last slide, something can be coherent, but it can still be not true, just because the premise one of those premises were false right? Based on the data. My point is, is that your, your logic and, or as I would put it, reason, because I use the two kind of interchangeably is based on the data that that's put into it, right? Like you can arrive at erroneous logical conclusions based on bad data that you have or, or incomplete data that can lead you down, not seeing the full picture. Does that make sense? Yeah, just FYI. So one person here is saying, Bill, you have a super bad echo on Jacob's channel, which means I'm probably coming through twice. Okay. Let me so uh, you, it, maybe if you I mute think it me, should be. I think let me see if it's coming through. Yeah. If you mute me on StreamYard on your side, I should only come through once. Okay, people, can you can you hear somebody make a comment if they can still hear Bill? Bill, go ahead and just uh, um, give a yep. talk. Absolutely. So uh my name is Bill Real. Executive Director of Mormon Discussion Incorporated. And we'll see if somebody... Can people he hear Bill? I see something. Someone said Echo is better for sure. But I just want to see if they're still hearing you at all on my end. Yeah, totally. Um, say he's really quiet now. Hold, hold so on one I, second. Yeah, my hunch is that you need me to come through normally on StreamYard, but somehow I'm coming through through your mic earphones through your computer as well let me let me just check something real quick yeah, on no problem. My Take end time. with audio okay yeah something okay, i'm gonna, I'm gonna okay. turn you back on and, and folks just fyi for those who are listening on, on our youtube channel with mormon discussion uh, yes everything is going to sound great there where the technical the, the technical issue is on uh, Jacob's side with his channel. Yeah, so as I'm if, streaming it over You'll all be patient for just a moment. We just want to make sure that the folks following him and listening on his side can also enjoy the, the conversation. Okay, now they should yep. be able to hear it, but they're hearing all right, an folks. echo, they said. Let me do this real quick. Okay, go ahead, Bill, and yep. don't, now they might not be able to hear me. Ask them if they can hear me. Can you guys hear me right now? I want to see like if they're I hear, hearing everything's me. good on my end, of course. But yeah, yeah, I want to see if the, my audience is hearing it right now. Okay, can they hear me? They said echo is gone. So go ahead and just t talk, Bill. Yep. Say, can you guys hear um, Jacob? During this time of great excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great <laughs> uneasiness. Okay, and, so as I'm coming through, that's funny because I'm... They said they couldn't hear me now. Um, shoot. Echo is gone. Echo is back. That's so funny because I feel like we're doing it the same way as we did last time. Sorry, everybody, about the technical difficulties here. We'll have to fix this. 
Okay, they say they can hear me. All right, Bill, go ahead and give a check one, two, three. Let's let's yep, hear one check, more. Check one, two, three. Check baby, check baby, one, two, three. Okay, people are saying we're both good on my end. Perfect. That, Love it's it. so it's funny because <laughs> I didn't I didn't really change anything. Here we go. <laughs> so just again, just to note, you're using reason in place of the word logic here when really you you seem to indicate you mean logic, and that just because a argument is logical it may still be deeply unreasonable, ridiculous, or absurd. Yeah, I, I guess the only distinction here, and this is maybe just a linguistic thing that we're doing here, is yeah. is you're, you're kind of saying that it it's reasonable if it's true. Could something, in, it, the way it's you're framing it, could something if, be reasonable and untrue? Um, I don't know if I want to use that language. So I would say that re, the, the most, using reason is trying to figure out which of the arguments in a disagreement requires the least inferences? And so okay. whichever set of uh, premises can be shown to have the least amount of conjecture, that's the most rational, reasonable conclusion. It could still be untrue, but we're left, we have to go with the most rational conclusion because if we go with anything less, we're being irrational. Yes. Yeah, okay. that's fair fair enough. And I would say that that reason and logic are very much predicated on the data that gets fed into them, right? If if you are fed bad data, you can come to untrue things even though you are being perfectly logical. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um so let's talk about, you know, obviously you get data, one of the ways that you get data is through sense data, right? Through your eyes, through your ears, through all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um we also will talk, though, about things being true based on their outcomes. So, for instance, the only reason that you trust an authority is because an authority is um, is that an authority is um, has shown through the outcomes of what they're doing that in reality they actually know what they're talking about. Does that make sense? So, so the outcomes are one of the ways that we validate that something pertains to reality, that it is For instance, is I can't, yeah, for instance, I can't understand exactly everything about gravity. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, it's not my specialty, but I throw an apple up, it comes down. So hence, I trust that the experts on gravity are telling the truth because everywhere I see it, it works the way they say it does. Yep, exactly. Okay. Very good. All right. And then, and then I'm going to come to the last one. And this is one that a lot of it, it, it's it's of all of them, it's the toughest one to describe. OK, um, but there is, I think, at least people will posit that there is such a thing as intuitive knowledge, right? That there are things that you know, but that are very, very difficult to say exactly why you know them. They are just evident to you in some way. So, for instance, you will say racism is wrong. and if you're going to, but, or, or that it's wrong to cause harm, right? Like these are things or unnecessary harm, as you might say it, these are intuitive judgments that we make. Um, and again, I, 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 I want to say, I, I know I'm not encapsulating this fully because intuition is one of those hard things to describe, but we all kind of, <laughs> quote unquote, know what it is because of it's more of an experiential thing than it is something that is purely cognitive in some way. Does that sort of make sense? Yes. Let me just throw another person here saying, I just want to make, see if you agree or agree, because then there would be limits to what you're posing. The model that you're showing emphasizes deductive and inductive logic, but neglects retroductive and abductive logic. Do you agree with that? So I don't even I, know what that means. Again, this I'm isn't not, my, I'm this not is my sure. wheelhouse. I'm not, I'm not super familiar with retroductive. I am familiar with abductive reasoning. So yeah. this is abductive reasoning is events is essentially an inference to the best explanation of something. So if you have a competing set of things that you, yeah. uh, that, you know, propositions, it's all right, well, which one seems to be the most probable. And in fact, this is, uh, this is very much, what I'm going to go into in this. So as we go further in this, that might become to become clarified. And then the second point would be when you ask me if I agree with what you said about intuition with the caveat that some folks get their in, their intuitions right and some folks their intuitions wrong. 
And there may be uh, an ability to say some people are better with their intuition than others, but to note that intuition is based on whatever came before for you. And you're making essentially this gut feeling about what's about to happen or what things are, and that that can be deeply hit or miss with various ratios of success. 100%. 100%. Okay. So, so here's where I would go with this. Let's go to slide 10. And you're actually hitting on what I call, and it's something that I get frustrated with, even with members of the church, um, is what I call the feelings alone heresy. This is where it's sort of like you ignore all the other witnesses, <laughs> right? It doesn't matter what the outcomes are. It doesn't matter what sense data say. It doesn't matter what reason says. It doesn't matter what authorities say. It's just whatever I feel is what is true. And that's just a distorted uh, epistle. Like you're just ignoring all of the other ways to know truth. And you're purely going internally to say that truth is what I feel it is rather than truth being something that exists outside of just your feelings or your, and I don't even call them feelings because I think that can sort of cheapen it. I like to use the word intuition because We'd be crazy to say that we don't intuit things or there aren't things that we have intuitive knowledge of. It's just it's just to deny, in my opinion, an aspect of our nature as human beings. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So so I am very much against the what I call the feelings alone heresy. And it happens within the church and it can happen outside of the church in other contexts as well, where people will will say that's kind of everything rests on that now. If you go to the next slide, there's another heresy that I see happen both inside and outside the church, and that's the authority alone fallacy. That's where you ignore all other witnesses to truth simply to say that, well, if the brethren said it, it's true, right? It doesn't matter what everything else says. And I, and, and I would also say, though, in a secular context, those who say, well, the experts say it, therefore it's true, and they don't feel the need to provide any reason or any outcomes, or any, or any of the other witnesses here, no matter how irrational something is, it's like, well, the authority said it, therefore it's true. And so we have to be careful because while any one of these witnesses is a witness that should be taken into account, we have to be careful that we don't ever get into the habit of saying, hey, this one is the trump card. One of the big critiques that I have, for instance, of... Um, the doctrine of sola scriptura, which is held by a lot of of, of um, uh, other faiths and and scriptural infallibility, is that is the claim that the authority of the written words in the Bible in their original autographs is the trump card. It is the word of God. It is it is like it can't be wrong, and that is to say that those people who wrote those words acted infallibly. And so anytime you want to say either intuition or outcomes or sense data or any of these things trump all the rest and is 100% reliable, it is to claim that one of these witnesses is infallible. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if the moment that someone claims that one, and there's this, it's an unhealthy quest in my opinion for infallibility. Because the idea is if you can find an infallible source of truth, well, then you can just, that thing is the thing, the only thing that really matters because it will give you the truth hundred percent, right? Whether that's yeah. authority, intuition, whatever. And so this is the model by which, um, I sort of judge these things. Now I would go one, um, Go, go one more slide down um, to just some of these questions that I ask, you know, are, are one of these more important than the others? Is one the trump card or does it depend on the context? And that's, that's very much, I think this is a very important recognition. For instance, if I'm dealing with the physical world and the nature of subatomic particles, I'm going to spend a lot more time looking at things like sense data or not even sense data, really, uh, mostly authority, because I've never seen that stuff and reason are going to be kind of the two areas where I spend most of my time. Um, 
exploring what has been said by authorities to then determine. Because again, unless I'm actually doing the experience and seeing with my own eyes the the subatomic reactions or whatever, uh, and in fact, even the authorities when it comes to subatomic particles, they can't even use their physical senses to see them. They have to do uh, experiments and other things that give them data that they can then use reason to arrive at conclusions about, right? So, but then again, now, now I'm talking about, what about human relationships, right? Um, if I'm studying the nature of our human interactions with one another uh, and what produces the best, let's say, family dynamics or something like that, I may look uh, more, I'm not going to be using sense data per se, right? I'm going to be utilizing more intuit intuition outcomes and other things of that nature to arrive at what the truth is around those sorts of those sorts of phenomena. So it it is very much again imagine that you you have witnesses who are coming forward but these witnesses have different areas of expertise that allow you to rely more heavily on one rather than another in a given context. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we continue to go on um, in the next one here, in number slide 13, I, as I was exploring this subject um, of knowledge, I, I was trying to figure out, I, I noticed something, for instance, it was very clear to me that authority emerges from outcomes because someone isn't an authority unless they actually, through the outcomes, like demonstrate what they are uh, th that they actually know what the heck they're talking about and that they can be relied on as an authority, right? Including yourself, by the way, <laughs> you know, you, 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 your own intuition is a, is a, is a, is a source of, in a way it's a source of authority where you, you through the outcomes begin to trust what you think, right? Where if you get things wrong over and over and over, you start to go, well, maybe I shouldn't trust just whatever I feel. Cause I'm really bad at reason. I'm really bad at my intuitions. I'm just going to kind of trust in the authorities and what they say, right? But it was clear, again, the point I'm making is that authority emerges from outcomes. And then I began to ask myself the question, but wait a minute, does outcomes emerge from something, right? And it really emerges from reason. It's, it's rational that if something is producing a similar outcome over time, that you can, you can infer that those outcomes will continue into the future. Although I think Hume makes a pretty powerful critique of this, but that's kind of a different uh, a different subject. So then I began to look at even things like reason. Like, is reason fundamental? Like, is there something out there that's the most fundamental of all? But as we talked about ourselves, reason itself, and, and by the way, this little model that I have up on the screen, I if you want to know like where I'm at, where I'm still trying to like sort things out, there are things I'm more, more like feel like I've, I've kind of mapped out and understand this area of the interplay and relationships between these and what emerges from what is an area that is, I'm still deeply exploring. So please recognize everyone. I'm not like stating this, like, Oh, this is the way it is. I'm kind of laying out a model of understanding that I have here, but it seems here that even reason itself is dependent on the data that's fed into it. As we had said before, you can have, you can be pers perfectly logical, but just get the wrong, not have all the data. Does that make sense? Yes. And I assume you would agree that we do the best we can. And again, I, I'm, I'm a little caught off guard because as we show all these slides, again, I would want to keep inserting logic where you have the word reason, because I think Reason is the underlying principle that then points to all five of these and gives you the best way in which to measure. And again, we're all limited. I'm not a scientist. So when we get into uh, quantum mechanics, I have to trust the authorities and I can test them against other authorities and I can, I can use whatever other skill sets I have to try to figure out which authority is creating the least amount of conjecture to get yeah, to your conclusion, you're, right? You're testing the authority utilizing reason. But, um, so I agree with you with the caveat that reason, which I don't think you're exactly hitting at, is the thing we use to test all five of these. 
with your reason actually being logic. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. And, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that when, okay. and, and here's what I mean by that. When we're engaging in conversation, we're actually engaging in reason. We're engaging in logic. We're, we're utilizing language to discuss things that are like the, like you would say, the words are, you know, we, as, we ascribe meaning to these words. We hope the other under, other person understands what we mean. But what, what's actually happening is, is I'm trying to convey intuitive sensory sort of experiences that I've had. I'm trying to transform those into a linguistic model that I'm then conveying over to you so that you can then understand what's going on. Like you're able to connect the experiences and things that I'm having with reality, with yours. And you're saying, Hey, we both are seeing the same reality, right? Does that, does that, so, so there's, but what I'm saying is, is that it seemed, and this is the question I guess I'm trying to address. I was asking the question, is reason fundamental to knowledge? Is it like where everything ultimately uh, gets to, right? And what I found is that no, reason seems to be a tool that we use to play with the raw data, to organize it and to analyze it. But it's not the raw data itself. Does that make any sense? Yes, but not exactly. And but continue, please. Like uh, I'll work with that premise, and then when you're done, I'll kind of present maybe a different thought around all of this. But go yeah, ahead. That's fine. That's fine. So what I have found um, as I've done this, and I have just so anybody wants to see me lay this out fully here with all of the citations and like different people talking about it. Um, is on my channel, I have a, a, a playlist of how do you know, and it basically goes through this collective witness model from start to finish uh, in more detail. But what I arrive at in that is that basically our intuitive experience of the world is actually the most fundamental thing. It, 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 is, it is what is, right? Like um, I think Descartes says, I think therefore I am, right? It is the, it is, and and what he means by that is that Descartes was a he he wanted to rationally base everything, and what he came down to was as he was reasoning, the only thing that he could get to that reason that was sort of infallible was that he existed, because it couldn't be otherwise. He th there wasn't a possibility he couldn't exist because in order to even think about things he had to exist, was his basic was his basic contention. Um. And so the experience of actually being, of existing, and I would say, and this is where words begin to fall apart. I think at some part, language actually, you run out of language to even describe what's going on. The only thing you can do is you can say, there's something that you experience that then acts as the lens through which you view the world. If you go to the next slide, Stephen R. Covey has this quote where he says, we see the world not as it is, but as we are, or as we are conditioned to see it. When we open our mouths to describe what we see, we in effect describe ourselves, our perceptions and our paradigms. In other words, the world may be objective, but it's being filtered through our intuitive experience of it. And so Jonathan Haidt, if you go to the next slide, has this really great uh, example that he uses of the rider and the elephant. And again, if we're asking if reason is fundamental, he very much rejects this. Jonathan Haidt says what reason is and, and rationality is us giving a post hoc explanation to the intuitive experiences that we have. A and that doesn't mean that what we're saying doesn't pertain to reality or that reason has no use. It's just, I guess I would say, kind of like I was saying before, that reason is subject to the data that you're feeding it. And so the real question be becomes like, what is the raw data that you're feeding into um, human beings? And so if you go back up to slide number 13, 
I would say that something approximating intuition is really where the rubber meets the road. That is where we interface with reality. I can be blind. I can be deaf. I can have all these sorts of things gone, but the thing that will still remain is this, whatever this conscious intuitive experience is. And so just to, to kind of reiterate, I, I can kind of go back to the very beginning here, um, is that we are, human beings are trying to understand the nature of reality. Some will say that reality is merely the physical, that that encapsulates the full breadth of reality. If you want to go back here real quick to slide number two, uh, I think just so we can visualize kind of what's in my mind as I'm talking about this, is that there, there's a big question of that big ball over that reality that we're in that's apart from us. What is the nature of it? Is it purely just material? Is that the presupposition that you're going into in the world? Does a purely materialistic explanation account for things like consciousness, things like morality, things like thought? Do, or is reality something bigger than that? Is there a realm that extends beyond that? And then, and I mean, these are really deep questions. But the thing is, is that depending on what you presuppose will depend on what tools you even think are legitimate. Because if everything can be explained, in ter if, if you presuppose that the world is purely um, a physical Newtonian world, which I think we we both would reject that it's not because of the nature of quantum uh, and, and Einsteinian physics. Um, we have to recognize that there, and I would say that there, there's a world of conscious experience and that that reality becomes something much bigger, much more dynamic. And therefore you need additional tools to be able to fully comprehend the nature of reality. And so what I, when I talk about my testimony within the context of the church is my testimony is the collection of these witnesses and what they tell me. I will then go and bear to others my testimony of what I perceive this reality to be based on what I think are all of these tools that we have to help us perceive the nature of reality. And that, and, and, when we say, does somebody have a testimony in the church, what we generally are referring to is that they are someone who has received a witness of the reality that is, it can be any aspect of reality, but often in the church, we're talking about the nature of the reality that extends beyond the mere physical or the mere material, and that reality is something bigger than that, and they are witnessing what they have experienced in relation to that aspect of reality. And so... Anyway, that is my 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 explanation of uh, or my best approximate explanation of understanding the nature of reality itself. And so I'm curious to see it, you know, contrast maybe your model for understanding reality and how that maybe contrasts or conflicts with the things that I'm talking about. Sweet. So and I want to note here because uh so we've been going now for about almost 45 minutes. I know a few minutes of that was technical issues and there was an introduction at the beginning by me. So let's at least grant, let me kind of control the conversation for maybe the next 35 minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So the first thing is that when you say intuition is really kind of the main push, I would note in the arena of religious belief, the far wide majority of human beings on this planet when trying to deal with which religion is true and which belief system is true, no matter which system you agree is right, or if you don't believe any of them, we would all have to agree that almost everyone is getting it wrong. In other words, if you believe Mormonism is true, the people using their intuition to know that Jehovah's Witnesses are true, or Catholicism is true, or Islam is true, are incorrect. I would say that intuition alone is a terrible tool okay. to use for for, yep. for evaluating any truth claim. Sweet. So let me um, let me throw this up. So throughout your slides, you're using the word reason when you actually mean logic, and we talked a moment ago about how logic and reason differ. With every one of your five tools, 
the only way we can inside ourselves figure out what is the most rational answer to authority, whether they're being truthful or accurate, whether our intuition is right or not, whether the outcomes are tied to actual truth or if it's just coincidence or, or some other explanation is to use rational thinking. And so anytime you make a, uh, a premise or an imposition or a belief, we have to then go, is that reasonable or not? And using reason. Um, so for instance, uh, we talked about the, both of those are logical. Only the top one is reasonable. Let me read this. Obviously the premises in this argument are not true. Meaning the toasters <laughs> one. It may be hard to imagine these premises being true, but it is not hard to see that if they were true, their truth would logically guarantee the conclusion's truth. It is easy to see that the previous example is not an example of a completely good argument. A valid or logical argument may still have a false conclusion. When we construct our arguments, we may aim to construct one that is not only valid or logical, but also sound or reasonable. A sound argument is one that is not only valid, but begins with premises that are actually true. Now, we're in this realm where we're talking about testimony and Mormonism and truth claims. We're not exactly going to be able to definitively go, here's a wood table here. Um, we're going to have to play in the realm of not being absolutely certain that something is true. When we can agree on the premise being true, the premise that is the least inferential, the least allowances or conjecture is the most rational premise. All other premises are irrational. So um, if we if we trick, uh, if we use rhetoric or argumentation and make our arguments based on logic. Can, can I just make sure, can I just make sure I'm understanding correctly? I just don't want to, I just want to make please. sure that I'm not, I'm not yeah. going off. So, so what you're talking about is that there's a difference between the soundness of an argument and the validity of an argument. And validity means it, it follows the appropriate logical structure, right? Premise, mm -hmm. premise, conclusion, yeah. but it, but it's only sound if those premises are true, because if the premises are false, you can have a valid argument that's not sound simply because one of the premises are not true. I would also argue that in this space, we would have to say it is sound if it is the most likely conclusion to be true based on the data and what's going on. So, because we can't really know, right? Like we can't exactly, I'm, I'm a hundred percent, you know. Yeah. Okay. I'm, so nice. I think, I think I know what you're saying. Let me just see if I can restate it. So you're saying Please. that, um, you know, for instance, in this, all, all, all toasters are items made of gold. That's just a false, uh, that, that's a, that's a flawed premise. So that's why this argument is valid, but it isn't sound. And the reason that it is, uh, and we know that because we have experiences in the world with other items that are not made of gold. Right. This one we can prove, but in matters of religious belief, we can't prove, even when the odds are deeply stacked against Scientology. You and I both agree Scientology is absurd, uh -huh. but it's so stacked against Scientology that we still can't, in that realm, push the imposition that it's absolutely false. There's no way to do that. So the best yeah. our the best you can't we can prove, do you can't prove a negative. So the best we can do is to figure out whether Scientology being true or Scientology being false, which conclusion conclusion requires the least amount of conjecture and allowances and inferences. Okay. Okay. All right. So with that, for instance, if we have a crime scene here. Mm -hmm. Um, we see something's going on, the police tape, there's things broken, there's splatter on the wall. We could suggest that it's a, 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 you know, a vandal. We could suggest it's a baby. We could suggest it's leprechauns and we could use all of your five tools to arrive at any of those three decisions. But the way that we figure it out is by using reason. And so we look at what makes the most rational sense to figure out what is going on. And I think you agree with that. Like at least yeah. in now, now I would now I would say I would say there is one thing here that we have to take into consideration. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is an actual experience that you were there at the crime scene and you were there and actually like it was a baby that did it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it was some kind of crazy super baby that sure, was there. But then you're going to you were... explain your reason and you're going to convince me or try to anyway, that the baby doing it makes the, it, it requires the least amount of inferences and conjecture. And well, you're and, going to be and, able to add how but, the baby did all these things so that I'm now going to be able to have new information and change my mind to a new conclusion. You're right. You're right. Now, now here's the thing though. If you were there and you saw the baby do it or whatever, you saw a leprechaun or obviously these are kind of crazy examples. But the thing is, is that I could never convince you unless you saw it yourself. I disagree. I, I can become convinced of things based on it being the most rational. Based, based on it merely being the testimony of another person, you could be convinced? No, no, what I'm saying is that if you explain your reasons, if you say, look, I was there, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. The baby was doing this. It led to that. Here's how this got. Now you're adding information that now makes the conclusion that the baby did it Um able to be now weighed on a different set of my perception of what's going on. I can change my conclusion or what I think is rational or absurd based on the new information of you explaining how the baby did all the things it did. Okay. And then, and, okay. and fair, fair enough. But okay. if let's say it was a leprechaun, right? Like you, you just would say leprechauns don't exist. You presuppose that they simply do not exist. And so mm -hmm. Are, are you actually saying that if I saw a leprechaun do something, you could actually can be convinced that a leprechaun exists merely off the testimony of another person without actually having experienced one yourself? Yeah, because each each uh, imposition that you suggest is going to have to, again, cross a threshold where it it is the conclusion that requires the least amount of allowances and conjecture. Because even if you say I'm there and I saw the leprechaun, there are possibilities such as you're mentally ill or that you were on uh, uh, psychedelic drugs. And hence, your inner experience is never on its own going to be enough to convince any other human of anything unless people are willing to be irrational. Yeah, and I, and, and I might say that, that and, and I think that's why I say that actual direct experience with something is the most fundamental. Because like, for instance, what if we're dealing like talking about God, um, what is the like evidence? Like, like if you saw God, if God popped into the room right now and spoke to you and said, Hey, Bill, I'm real based on reason, you would rightly say that wasn't God. I was hallucinating. Regardless of what I say, it would still be my own internal experience, and it wouldn't be justification for anybody else to take my word for it. That's fine and and, and okay. fair enough. but but I, but would you say that that experience is valid? Um, if that happened to me, I would wait I would use reason to try to figure out if I was mentally ill or if I was wrong about there being a supreme being. So if someone's so if someone's lived experience doesn't accord with reality or reason, then we can say that that person's experience is not valid. Uh, everyone's experience is valid. You you sense the data that comes into your senses. No one can take that away from you. The interpretation you apply to it is is uh, up for lots of misunderstanding and misinterpretation and. Hence, when you claim things that have no outward evidence for them, you're claiming an internal experience and there's no way for that to hold any weight with anyone outside of yourself if reason, if there is no reason behind why that is true. Otherwise, I, I, everyone is competing in this arena of religious belief and I'd have no way to really know. Um, so you can claim that, God isn't talk that kind to you. Of the isn't that kind of the same thing that people bring up? Like for instance, and, and I don't want to derail it and I'll, I'll get back to this, yeah. but, but I just feel like the, I see people outside of religion talk about the validity of, for instance, trans people's experience. And that even if it doesn't accord with reason that their experiences are valid and that, but, but in my mind, it's like a person's, and I agree with you, actually, if a person's experiences do not accord with reality and with reason, 
well, then they're probably misinterpreting their experience. And the only way that I can know that they're not is to actually have the experience myself. But if I don't have the experience, then for, as an outside observer, I have to conclude that this person is, is irrational. Yeah. The difference is that you're right to an extent. So the trans person is having an experience. We are going to be limited at understanding that experience from genetics or epigenetics or science, maybe altogether. But those things do play a role. And so I, I feel, for instance, when I deal with the trans issue different than other folks, that I'm actually using some degree of reason as I lean on the prevailing psychologist and geneticist talking to me, not just about trans issues, but other things for which aren't showing up in the majority of humans, but for which show up in a small percentage. For instance, serial killers and pedophiles and us knowing that that's epigenetic it seems also to make sense that there would be other anomalies within human expression that aren't the majority that science would then defend as going like hey it's reasonable that even though we can't quite get to the heart of this that there is at least the possibility this is a real experience and should we again trust authorities or science i see um, so so just just to make sure i understand you're you're saying that that hypothetically these things are caused by genetic factors, epigenetic factors within trans people. And so we could actually have the ability to use science to, at least hypothetically, to determine if a person really is trans or not based on what the actual data and science say. Yeah, we, we should go with whatever position requires the least amount of inferences or conjecture. And I don't want to get lost in this issue because yeah, that's fine. It really and, and, is important. I, I, to this. Yeah, no, I, I, and the only reason I'm bringing it up is it just has to do with the idea of ex is experience most fundamental or is reason most fundamental because you could have an experience of something. And then I think you can use reason to either misinterpret it uh, or to misrepresent it. But I also totally. would say that the, the experience itself, the raw data of the experience is the most fundamental thing because reason ultimately is a tool that we're using based on the data that's actually coming in, right? With the acknowledgement that experience in re the, arena, the arena of religious belief leads the majority of people by far, significant majority, to be wrong at any given moment. Yeah, I, I would say that if you're just relying on the data alone, you're not, or I'm sorry, just relying on the intu intuitive experience alone and yeah. not taking into account the other witnesses of truth, I do think that that will lead you straight. And it's one of the reasons that I, to the Latter-day Saints, and like the people who push kind of like, well, I feel it, therefore it's true. It's like, no, yeah. <laughs> like you got to do better than that. That's I, I'm not denying that experience may be fundamental and important, but we have to interpret these experiences uh, according to things beyond just, hey, just because I felt it, therefore it is. But it's 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 yeah. a tough question because if yep. God appears to you, um, you can reason your way out of believing that it was God, even if it was God. Totally. Reason is also flawed because we never have all the evidence, but it's the best we can do is to be reasonable. If we're If we're unreasonable, then we can certainly believe in absurd things. And those absurd things could turn out to be true, but it will be the learning of new data on some sort that will convince us that it's true. It's, we don't, we don't believe things to, we shouldn't anyway, we shouldn't believe things to be true before it's the most rational thing to believe. But, and there, but is that the case? Like, I mean, can reason be used to justify things that are horrible, but hey, it's reasonable, therefore we should do it. I mean, it's, I, I think scientifically, it is reasonable if you, if your goal is the propagation and success of the human species to eliminate in some way those who are, you know, weakening the herd and therefore, you know, kind of eugenics makes perfect rational sense from that sort of a perspective. And so reason in my mind has to be subject to values. I would say that values are actually more fundamental than reason because reason becomes the tool that we use to sort of impose our values or to to try and make manifest our values on the or, or uh, in the world. And so if your values are wrong, like like Hitler or something, he can use reason to do terrible terrible he things. He can use he can use logic. 
I, I, this is where we're confusing the two. So I don't agree okay. with your premise. Okay. All right. So let me use an example. Go ahead. And, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, um, to kind of permit yourself. Let me just do it this way. Did you watch Mormonism live this week? You probably didn't. I'm assuming. Uh, I, I did actually watch, yeah. watch some of it. I, okay. I, bits and pieces. Okay. So let's just take a claim for instance. I don't want to, I don't want to do this thing where we're like, okay, the CES letter point number one, you know, where do you, I just, <laughs> I want to address it from this issue of like critical thinking and how we use ration rationale and, and reason in the arena of religious belief. Joseph Smith here claims that he knows the Adamic language mm -hmm. in telling us the Adamic language. He is using both. He is, he is telling us the Adamic language includes English and foreign words that sound similar to English words from an ancient language we couldn't know anything about. But he is claiming specifically the mm -hmm. ancient language itself contains both words that are similar to words that we know but are from an ancient language and English. Mm -hmm. Do you, based on reason and critical thinking, does Joseph Smith – know the Adamic language? No, I don't think he does. No. no, he doesn't. Okay. Joseph Smith here claims that Mormon means literally more good. It's the Egyptian word mon that means good. And it's combined with the contraction of, a, of an English word more. Do you think Joseph Smith here understands or comprehends how to actually translate the word Mormon? No. No. When... When we go to the book of Moses and we find scriptures in there that are deeply connected to the book of Luke and the book of Matthew in such a way that it seems as though the person writing the book of Moses is going to the book of Luke and the book of Matthew and copying themes and then implementing them into uh, the book of Moses as if it was a unique text tied directly to Moses's experience. Does your critical thinking skills, does do red flags go up that something other than an authentic translation of an ancient text is happening? Well, I would say that I don't believe that the best explanations for the uh, translations given by Joseph Smith are direct word-for-word -word translations. I, I, I ascribe more to Blake Osler's sort of expansion theory and that kind of stuff. But I want to, real, real quick, let me- Hold on, doesn't that start with the, that, doesn't that point of view- Start with the conclusion one wants to have, that the church be true, and then comes up with, again, inferences, which you're doing mm -hmm. when you say like, oh, like if we allow this to happen and Joseph's doing that, and if we allow a tight translation and a loose translation, do you sense that you're adding conjecture to the argument? Based, it depends on the premises that you've already accepted, okay? So- this is the this is the way that I I use the 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 understanding and why I brought up kind of those models of understanding right, it, it, having discussions about Joseph Smith's translation message methods of course make absolutely no sense without certain premises that you have to have already arrived at. Give right? me a premise that you're willing to defend as the one that like, I want to know how you got to the premise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, no, it, it, it so goes like this: Joseph I, Smith I, is I, an ancient. So, yeah. So, so here here's here's the way I get here. Okay. okay. So it begins, the, the conversation begins way before Joseph Smith. It begins with the question of if there's a God. Okay. And then let's agree uh, there's a God and let's agree that oh, he wants to know which, let's do that. He wants to know which church is true. How go well, let's to agree more, there's a God. What makes Mormonism now, now, true? Okay. Let's agree with that. Now okay. let's go to the next conclusion that has to be, uh, that a person has to arrive at before they even talk about Joseph Smith. And that's that Jesus is the Christ. And that and that the New let's Testament, agree. let's agree, the Jesus new, is the Christ. The New Testament narrative is essentially true. Okay, let's agree. Like, okay, sure, let's agree with that. Let's agree with that. Okay. okay. So now the discussion, the, the the question now that we're even asking, is not about is is about where is Jesus Christ's work today? We're coming from this with those foundations in place. And now I'm looking for Jesus Christ's work in the world, okay? Now I'm looking at, well, there's competing explanations for what the New Testament Jesus is. The New Testament, 
I think very compellingly argues that there was a church. I think the New Testament compellingly argues that that church was endowed with a priesthood hierarchical structure. And so the question then becomes, okay, where is, and, and I think the New Testament compellingly argues that baptism is required for salvation. Um, and so I want to so be have baptized. You read the Maxwell, have you read the Maxwell Institute's new book of ancient Christians? Uh, I, I actually have just barely started it as part of my study this so, year of the New Testament. Yeah, they're part, what they're essentially saying, and by the way, I think there's tons of evidence for this. The church has always held the claim that Jesus organized the Christian church and, yes. that, and that the restoration of the church today is done in the, it is, it is the, a, res, a restoring of Christ's church as established and we now know, and again, the church is now coming on board. Two premises aren't true anymore. One is that the experts agree, even inside the church, that Jesus didn't set up a Christian church. He was a Jew inside the what, Jewish what you, faith. What do, you, what do you mean when you say church? What are you talking about? Uh, an organization. Uh, so, so a, that he, so, so you, you, and I can read the New Testament and 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 look at what it says that he ordained a particular type of structure that existed. Was it exactly synonymous in every way with the way that the church is today? Of course not. It but wasn't do, even a separate entity outside of Judaism. It was. You're right because I don't think that we are a separate entity outside of Judaism per se. We how are can Judaism. You how if he did it inside of Judaism, how can you create a live branch from a dead tree? What I mean is that well. <laughs> I'll put it this way. The, and this is a whole other discussion we could have is that the Jesus Christ very clearly established a priesthood hierarchy of authority within the church. Okay. That was what he set up. When I talk about the church, I'm not talking about just a, a generic body of believers. I am referring to, and neither is the church. We're talking about a specific hierarchy. They're not today. Priesthood. Maybe they're not today. And they're sort of playing both sides but they're in the midst of having to reframe their theology on this. That, that, whatever you think that they're doing, that's fine. Do you I'm, agree I, though? I, no, 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 I'm I, asking you. Do you, you agree that me. they're re, Are they re, I am right now. Do, I'm, not are familiar they, with their, I'm not familiar with their arguments, so I can't really comment on that. Do you all sense I, though the idea behind apostasy and restoration and translation are all fluid right now and shifting? Uh, what is shifting? If, if they're shifting more towards the truth, I'm all for it. But the truth yeah. as I understand it is, is this, and I think that I haven't seen anything to convince me otherwise, is that Jesus Christ established a church, meaning a priesthood hierarchical group who had the authority to administer ordinances of salvation to the faithful and to basically uh, establish a kingdom of God on earth under the authority of the leaders of that group. And that that authority structure was perverted and lost it over time. And therefore, there was a need to restore the priesthood authority and the structure that came along with it. And the structure today is not exactly the same as it was then. But I but I don't believe that that was the I, I believe that what Jesus Christ was doing was establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Um, and that I believe that the church today is that is the most likely candidate for that manifestation. I think rationally you can make that case, but I also would say, and I, do I disagree with that premise. Go, so you have to defend that premise. And I you, don't know you, that that's you going to be as you, so, so you disagree with the premise that Jesus Christ established a church according to the New Testament narrative. I disagree with the premise that the LDS church is the closest thing to the organization that Jesus set up. And we also have to okay, deal so what, with. So what is? Here, let's let me um, give me a because, few more minutes because, here. I'll, I'll write, make a little note in your paper. Let, I, I want to make sure I get some time here to put no, this together. Fine, that's fine. Yeah, 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 you... that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just want to real quick just to kind of reframe where we were so we can continue with what you were talking about is I am saying that the Joseph Smith story, of course, is absurdity until you get to actually believe that there are angels, that there are miracles, that but you have God to use, actually. Uh, yeah. But but the what I'm saying is, is, is we have is to that, agree with your belief around those things. Um, we yeah, have to I, believe that angels yeah. don't have wings, for instance. And now we have to debate whether the people who say angels have wings are more right than the people who say angels don't have wings. And all of that is invisible stuff that's inside our heads. And there's no way to do that. So we have to, again, I, I don't want to be irrational. 
And I can't go to Mormonism is true and come to it the way you did unless we can get some legs. We talk about in session two, having legs underneath the house. Yeah. And so the legs are, the what legs is are... it outside of your internal thought processes and your internal senses that is convincing to me or anyone else outside of you that shows that your beliefs are rational? So bear with me for a moment. That's fine. We are so I don't even need this slide. You've already acknowledged Joseph Smith, at least in those two instances, yeah, is claiming just, to translate, so you know, but he's not. Just so you know, there are many things have been said by many church leaders that I think are their personal conjecture and that I don't Please. agree or are, are, are particular things that do are you true. think do you think it's rational? Like, let me show let me put let me put something else up on the screen. Give me a second here. So share screen. Let's use this. So share. I'm gonna put that up. So I created three documents, Prophets, Infallibility, A Record of Mormon Leaders, Reversals, and Abandonment of Past Teachings. So these are all the things that the church taught at one time and then changed. So we don't really, they've already shown they didn't have the ability on the front end to get it right. They've reversed their position. So their ability to discern truth is hit or miss, and it's significant. So there are 59 of those. Here's the next one. The Mormon truth crisis, examining the deception and obfuscation within Mormonism. These are instances in which church leaders seem to be deceptive, dishonest, lying, or obfuscating an issue. This is going to be much longer, I think. I think this one's around 73. Then I've got the Mormon paradox. These are a list of inconsistencies that challenge faith. For instance, Brigham Young saying that Moroni went from South America, if you believe that's the location, out to Manti to bless the temple, and then to Palmyra to bury the plates. Um, these are impositions. Shiz gets his head cut off and he raises up. Um, the black people were less valiant in the pre-orth life. And again, we've disavowed that since then. But these are moments in time where the church holds a position that seems deeply irrational. This one, I think, is 130-something long. Uh -huh. So again, for Mormonism to be true, it has to confront these points of view and it has to have something to offer to say, hey, this isn't absurd to believe in Mormonism because Jehovah's Witnesses in Scientology do the same thing you're doing, which is go, I don't care about all of that. It's still true anyway. And that is not a way that you can convince anyone who's being a rational thinker. So when I ask, is but it wanna, rational remember, that Nephi what, built a ship with his family, a small group of people uh, in, in the Arabian Peninsula and traveled across the ocean? Let me ask you this one. 2,000 young here, men. Here. Hold on. Hold on here, Bill. Let, let me you, control you, the conversation just, for a moment. I, I, I let you talk I, for a while. I know, but I want to be able to respond to some of this. You're just... You're just I know, but I let, you throw out, I let you throw out 45 minutes of things before I was I waiting for you. I, I was waiting for you to come back and challenge some of the things there. So no, no, I wanted to, to let you set the it. groundwork because I think you created a process to avoid confronting these things. You create, you created your own formula, but you, didn't, you left you didn't out. Have, you didn't have you any problem out. with that formula. No, I do though, you, because you left out actual using reason and you made reason somehow not the crux of figuring things out, but rather it's all of this internal sensory well, stuff. Well, we, no, we can, no, we can use reason though. You even agreed that we, then, that I'll reason, it, I'll reason just, ultimately but, is based on the data that you bring into it. And let me have one more and then I'll okay, let you talk. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And, but I want to talk about this one at depth. 2,000 right. young men, the stripling warriors, went to battle against a larger, more experienced army. Not a single stripling warrior died. And in that time period, in fact, they suffered wounds so severe that they fainted from blood loss. And yet not a single one died. Not a single one died from infection. Not a single one died in spite of there being no antibiotics or a disinfectant that would have. And just like I get the it, numbers. Game. I know. So I, 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 I and if you think I haven't confronted all of these sorts of questions. So my question is the Book of Mormon. If it's an ancient text, and again, if you're going to say Joseph Smith is making up parts of it, then we have to also go, isn't it most likely that he's making up all of it? So is are the stripling warriors real? And did 2,000 of them, or 2,013, because a few were added, did 2,000 of them plus go into battle? And did they make it through a battle with a larger, more experienced army? And do you believe that that happened and that none of them died? I believe that the Book of Mormon 
like most scripture, is mythologized history. Okay. Isn't the most rational answer then when we take all of these problems into account that this church is just as made up as Scientology and Jehovah's Witnesses? And if you say no, I need to get to the legs underneath the house yeah, sure. let's and do understand let's do, why, let's do, let's do why exactly in spite that. of all the problems is Mormonism still true. But when I go into Scientology or Jehovah's Witnesses, it's the very problems themselves that convince me that I sh it's not true. The problem is that you've rejected the very foundations upon which all of this is built. Okay. And and we have to is go this, back. Is this the wood tool though? Would your argument, please, I'm going to, so let's pretend for a minute that oh, hold I'm on, a Bill, Scientologist. Bill, can, I, can, I, can I respond? Let please. me respond. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Like going down the list of this, the thing is, is you have to understand that you have to go back to the very beginning. We are Christians. <laughs> like, so are Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm going to use them at every you're turn right. Here. And I would love Please. to have, I would love to have a comparative uh, analysis of Mormonism versus Christianity, and which one actually has a better case for aligning with the New that's Testament. That's subjective Jesus because they. It's subjective though because no. they believe they also have pieces in the scriptures that mesh with their faith better than other faiths do. So the, every the, faith is just as consistent with the New Testament as every other. No, but the believers inside the system think so. That's the trouble, Jacob. As a believer yeah, but, inside the system, but we've already we've already agreed though that there's a standard by which we can evaluate if a certain claim is a certain subjective claim, perception of reality is aligned with reality or not. That's what you're doing right now. My right, point here, but, Bill. Bill, let yeah. me let me build the legs. Let me build the legs here. Please. Okay, the legs upon which Mormonism is built is the first leg is the leg of theism. We believe that there is a God in the universe, okay? We believe, I believe, and I'll just give you my thing. I believe that it is more rational to believe that there is a God of some kind than there, that, that the universe is not. And, and we diverge there. Like, you disagree there, okay? So only then do I then move on to say, well, where is this God operating in the world? That then takes me to Christianity and the New Testament. And there's a whole conversation we can have about how I get there. The, the thing is, is when you're talking about these specific claims, they, of course they make absolutely no sense. They're utter absurdities. If somebody comes up to me and says that they saw God, like they're going to have, if, if I'm an atheist, I just presuppose that God doesn't exist in the first place. So I don't have the necessary foundations to even take the claims seriously. However, if you are a Christian who believes that there are actual scriptures that are written and that there are inspired prophets that exist in the world, you begin to look at this record and go, does this line up consistent with the New Testament conception of scripture? Is it consistent in all of those kinds of things? So you, you, I'm at I'm at the level three conversation as I talk about. It. That's where Mormonism exists. You and I diverge at level one or even beyond that at the even level zero, where we just don't even agree about the nature of truth itself, as we had in our last video. What's going on here is that you're, I'm going up this step by step because what can seem totally unreasonable suddenly seems reasonable when you find out that a certain premise is true. For instance, if we discover that there is a God and that Jesus Christ was the savior of the New Testament and that miracles happen and all those kinds of things, all of a sudden, not saying that that proves that this is true, but what it does is it adds additional premises now that you can make an argument that is reasonable that may have seemed reasonable if you didn't accept those prior premises. So that's the issue. My whole point is that if you're going to analyze belief, you have to start at the beginning. You're never going to get to any of this making any sense to you unless you've already gone through those prior steps. How did you arrive at there is a God? What is your legs for that? So that's a premise. That's not that now that, we have to now we have to show. So now we have to show how you reasonably came to the position that there is a God. Certainly. Um, so this is a big shift in the conversation, but I'm happy to have it. Um, so there are variety of arguments for the existence of God. I think that the most compelling for me um, is it's a, it's a version of the fine tuning argument that has to do with specified complexity. So I, I'd have to ask you how we could even arrive at the conclusion that there is an intelligent causation to the universe um, and, and yeah, to reality. We did that. So you, I think you listened to me and Spencer Wright have a conversation where we talked about even at the basis forms of life on this planet, 
that life chose to, uh, again, life did various things. Some for, uh, some amoebas, and again, I'm going back to the, whatever the I, old- hold I want to go back, I want to go back even further than that. I want to ask okay. conceptually, conceptually, how do we detect intelligence, intelligent causation? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know that. Again, you're, let, you're let, not, me, let, let me, sure. let me, then, then let me lay it out. That's fine. But, but to understand is you have to understand the right question. Cause if we're not asking, if we don't even have a model under which this could be shown to be true, of course, it's, you're never going to believe that it's true. So the question is, is, is there an intelligent causation to the created order of the universe? Okay. That's the first kind of question when you're exploring, does God exist? Because at, at the very least, we can define God as an intelligent causation to reality or, or to, or to the universe, yeah. let's say. The, the trouble with this argument, Jacob, is that you have as one of your pillars authority, and there, and for the the prevailing opinion among no, I'm just using reason, I, and I'm not using I'm not using the authority fallacy. No, no, no. no I, I, don't, I think you're misunderstanding me. I so value the, reason over authority, and I don't. Perfect. And so, I've heard I've heard yeah. the arguments against fine tuning, but I know. none of them deal with specified complexity. The trouble, though, with what you're saying is that you have as one of your pillars authority and what you and I would agree with, even if you would disagree with them is that the, by far the prevailing opinion of the science, scientific of the, community because right, most scientists who doesn't hold, believe in God has their own way in which they make all of this work. And they answer the question to some degree in they, their heads, whereas you disagree with them but you're not trusting the authorities who are have more expertise than you and would know this field better than you. I, well, real it, quick, real quick, Bill. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I know what the authorities say, but the authorities presuppose metaphysical naturalism. Okay, they presuppose a particular view of the world that obviously leads them to those conclusions. What I'm what I'm arguing here Don't you? is I'm making an argument from reason. Okay, and no, I don't presuppose metaphysical natura, nat naturalism. I I am open to the possibility that metaphysical naturalism is not true. So here's here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is is that in the in reality there exists intelligent design. There exists intelligence, and the way that we can detect intelligent design is through something called specified complexity. This is, I believe, the strongest argument to be made. So let me make it. The way it works is this. Specified complexity is not just all the universe is complex. There are going to be people listening. I can already hear them. They're going to be like, oh, you just think because it's complex, that means it has to be created by a designer. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. Complexity can be designed or it can be random. So talking about complexity, let's use the example of a license plate. Okay. Bill, if you saw a license plate that was 1372BB, um, do you know what the chances are of getting that license plate, that exact series of numbers? It's like one in a bajillion, right? Like there, it's it's super unlikely that you're going to get that set of numbers. That is a complex set of numbers in the sense that it is unlikely to occur randomly, let's say, right? You're unlikely to get that set of numbers. But none of us look at that and say that that is anything but just a random set of numbers that appeared. The, the thing is this. What if you get a license plate that its series of numbers happens to conform to your birthday. Now, the most rational explanation of that would be that it was caused by an intelligent agent. Because Ooh. you have two you have two I don't, I don't agree with that premise. So so if you saw real quick then then let me clarify here. So you're saying that if you got a license plate that came in the mail that had your license your 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 birthday on it. Yeah. Like the exact numbers. Yeah. You would the you you think the most likely explanation for that is that it just was random. So you're conflating two different problems. So one, if it's a license plate that comes in the mail that has my birthday, yeah, I'm going to call that coincidence because those kinds of coincidences do happen that have nothing to do with religion or God or whatever. The other thing too is that if we just but is take that <clears throat> is, is it let, okay? Let's let's no. up the ante then. Let's say that your wife then gets <clears throat> it and it comes in. And it has her birthday on it. And then your kid gets one and it has their birthday on it. At what point, Bill, are you going to say this isn't just a coincidence? 
Sure. At some point, it's the person at the DMV playing games or something. Okay. Okay. Sure. Real quick. Real quick. I'm just saying. Uh, my point isn't the. My thing is, is that at some point, there's a level of improbability to something when you have two independently given patterns. One pattern is the pattern of the numbers themselves, right? But then there's this other pattern known as your birthdays, right? These are independent patterns. And the fact that this series of numbers, where any if given number is, is really unlikely, but to have it conform to an independent pattern is something that then says, this is evidence of design. Just so you know, Bill, this is scientific. This is what they do in the SETI program. The SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is a search for patterns in nature that are not just random patterns, but that conform to some independently given pattern, because that is the best way to detect intelligent causation. The same thing that archaeologists do. If you see a stone pillar, you could say, well, it was just caused by sand and wind and rain, but it's perfectly shaped and things like that. And the reason we infer that it was designed and that it was not purely random chance is because the independently given pattern of, of a house, for instance, this conforms to it and natural causation will produce patterns, but it doesn't produce patterns that match this other pattern that we know through experience is what a house looks like. So real quick, this is how you detect intelligent causation. Okay, you find two independently given patterns that match up, and that gives you evidence for causation. Now, the question is when we look at the constants and the parameters of our universe, they conform to an independently given pattern that didn't have to exist, namely the conditions necessary to have life. You could have had a universe that had any series of patterns in it, but it gave us the pattern that produces life. So the question is, out of all of the different possible universes that could have been created, why is it that we inhabit a universe where we exist and are having this conversation? Why does the universe have order at all? These are fundamental questions that I believe a theistic worldview gives a better accounting for that, that existing data than does any other explanation. And I've listened yeah. to the naturalistic explanations that ultimately have to rely on wild hypothesis that have nothing to do with our experience about multiverses that are, there's yeah. an infinite number and therefore anything that's possible happens. And it's, it's absurd. Yeah. So anyway, that's, 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 okay. that's I'm, I'm that's missing. The, that, I don't, let, let me just sum yeah. up. That's the, that is the, if we're starting at the very base level of how do you start to get up this level of God, that's at least where the conversation can start. And there are very good rational explanations for why a person could believe in God. Yeah. I, I disagree with the premise because only because you're right. I can't get back to the very beginning. And you're also right. You're hinting at this idea that we could argue that there are multiple universes. They collapse on each other. New ones start. Even if there was a God, he could have been dead a long time ago, whatever God means. Also being, if, and again, I don't agree that there is a God, but if there is, it still doesn't mean that Mormonism is true. And there's Absolutely leaps. You, and then when you say like, well, yeah, but the Mormon church most encapsulates the New Testament church. Well, because Mormonism is created after the fact, all it would take would be somebody to sit down with the scriptures and come up with the best. So if I sat down and came up with the best example of a church that most closely follows Christ's church, now I have the best church that most closely follows it. But because I'm doing it after the fact, I've got the cheat sheet, which is I'm reading the New Testament. Hence, Joseph Smith, as we well know, was very familiar with the scriptures. And for him to create a church that's similar to the New Testament church doesn't prove anything What's, Other what's than wild is actually answer. what's wild is how far Joseph Smith of the experts of his day, all of the theologians of his day. Yeah. One of the I think the biggest testimonies that I have of Joseph Smith was his theological innovations that were able to solve the problems that plagued Christianity for centuries. And in fact, I, I would say the reason I'm a Latter Day Saint, the reason I'm a Christian is different from the reason I'm a Latter Day Saint. The reason I'm a Latter Day Saint, I would say, amongst the top things, is 
the compelling theology that actually is rationally coherent when compared to other Christian explanations that have existed that, over that's time. That's a wood tool because people from all kinds of religions suggest such. And even if it was true, well, then if make Joseph the argument. Smith's making it up, he's allowed to come up with answers to things. So later, let's do another one real quick here. The lost 116 pages. Let's use our rational thinking. While Joseph Smith claimed to have had supernatural ability to use a seer stone to find lost items and to discern God's mind and will and to translate the Book of Mormon, he seemingly couldn't use that to locate the lost 116 pages. It seems irrational that the 116 pages weren't retranslated according to Joseph's reasoning. If he retranslated 116 pages and the old ones reemerged, and not even that they have to match, they would just have to be extremely similar. I, I think most Decent people who think with their minds would make room that not every single word would have to be the same, but the story would have to at least be coherent with the other one. It would have to have a lot of overlap, right? Mm -hmm. If he translated, if he retranslated the 116 pages and the old ones reemerged and matched, it would have proven he was a prophet. If the yeah, original 116 pages this is the old. This is the in. old. This is the old South Park episode. Like, Hold on, I, no, I, but it's I know not, what, though. I know. I know what the argument is. It's that no, why couldn't follow. he have retranslated the hundred and sixty pages? Not even that. Pages? If if somebody obviously else... this is evidence. Obviously, Bill, I I agree with you. This is evidence against Joseph Smith, hundred percent. But so you I, do I, I agree would... that the critical rational thinker would go. There's really not a good logical reason for why he played this out the way he did. Yeah, hundred percent. Now here's okay. here's my thing. Perfect. Uh, is there? Now, now, but I want to, we, we can look at all of the evidence against the church. Do you believe the right? Tower of Babel hold, is a literal hold, story? Hold on, hold on, Bill. Please. Let's, let's, let's balance this out here a little bit. We because have, you're picking and choosing which things of Joseph Smith you hold up as these are, these make me so excited that the church is true, but then you don't really want to throw in the bag no, I, I believe me, I'm aware. I'm aware of the evidences against yeah. the Joseph Smith story. Remember, you're looking only at the negative evidence. So let's use. No, no, let's I'm looking at both. One. Well, real quick, real quick. Mm -hmm. So what is the most rational explanation for all of the, all of the, the, uh, congruent things that happen in the old Testament ge or in, in the old world geography in the beginning of first Nephi, Joseph, like what is the chance that you find a place that has all of the things in bountiful? What are the chances of you finding all, you know, finding Nahum and finding, and, and it happens at exactly the spot where you expect the turn to happen in the road. What are the, you know, there are so many other evidences. If we were to just line up evidences for and against the church, which by the way, I've done bill. Like I, it's not like I'm unaware of all these things that you're bringing up. What I'm saying though, is, is that we can take a look at the evidence for and the evidence against. And what I arrive at on a purely rationalistic basis is that mm -mm. I believe a purely that there logical is logical basis, not fine, rationalistic. Fine. I, I, I would, I would argue rational is that what I'm looking at here is that there is a bunch of evidence for and against. And yeah. that what and and I'm not saying that a, a solid case against there are good reasons to doubt the story of Joseph Smith. However, okay, I believe that the preponderance of the evidence is there. And I do believe that the other things that undergird this, the fact that I believe that there is a God, the fact that I believe that Jesus Christ was who the New Testament made him out to be, still leaves this imperfect story with its own doubts and issues as the best explanation of what Jesus Christ is doing today. I don't agree with your premise. And yeah, you don't agree I with start, the premise but, that God but, exists. No, no. But anytime I lay out, so here's the trouble. Mormonism can't afford to get half of its stuff, right? It, it has to get a certain number of things. It makes truth claims and it's being true depends on those claims you, you're saying that every single thing the church has ever said and anything joseph ever did or said has to be right and no no, true? no 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 it's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is that there has to be at least some degree of things holding up and if we went through every one of the church's truth claims i almost feel like you would agree with me that on a rational level all a, 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 a whole bunch of them wouldn't add up do you do you agree with I, that I, all of them wouldn't add up if you uh, reject the idea of no, no, God no. and Jesus Christ. You, no, you no, have no, to remember, no, Bill. I'm not Bill, doing that. Our, our hold did, on, you're you're creating a false you're, you're, argument. Well, what you're saying, what you're doing here, and I can see exactly what you're doing, and it's and it's fine. You're saying, look at all these things in Mormonism from an atheistic perspective and how they don't make any sense. But if you, if I were to say, now, mm -hmm. Bill, do this. Let's accept the New Testament is true, and then 
Now let's start to look at these no, things. I'll and you're right, there's still challenges, but there's a ton of other evidence that you're not mentioning here that actually supports the idea that, Jesus, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God because even the Bible itself talks about the need for prophets and the way that prophets operate and all that kind of stuff. You've rejected the, it's like you, you're, you're, you're mad about the, the calculus when you've rejected algebra and arithmetic you yeah, have to have accepted not apples and apples and but you haven't you haven't that th th that is the thing though bill our disagreement our disagreement mm. is not at the level of mormonism it's at so, the level of basic theism work okay so let's i'll just for the sake of argument let's agree that there is a christian god and christ is real okay. i still have to deal with the fact that mormon prophets seem unable to discern truth and i would list the examples and you would agree with me I have to. I have to I would, deal. With I would the, put this at, that that Mormon prophets have gotten certain things wrong. A Fine. lot of things wrong. All right. Okay. I, I think, and again, if we went through the list, you would agree with me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things wrong. So Mormon prophets don't seem to be dependable to discern truth from error. I would disagree. The, okay. Uh, okay. How did they do on race? How did they do on the causes of of homosexuality? How did they do on knowing what the apostasy was? How did they do if, on if knowing they had, exactly what the restoration was? How did they do on knowing what Joseph Smith's translation mode and ability were? How did they know, how good did they do on knowing uh, how Joseph translated the revision of the Bible and what that actually was? Like, If you think that the purpose of the gospel is for our leaders to reveal to us all and every historical fact with perfect I just accuracy. want them to be right when they think they're right. At I, least I, most of the time. And and I believe me, I will take with a grain of salt things that they say when they talk about things that that maybe are outside of their scope of understanding. But what it really comes down to is what is their level of knowledge when it comes to spiritual uh fulfillment and human flourishing. That's and a wood what, tool because the Jehovah's Witness would say the same thing. No, about a Jehovah's leaders. Witness does not have the same amount of their outcomes that they have are not comparable to those of Latter-day Saints. Oh boy. And nor, I, nor an atheist, as we pointed out that. last time, that that human thriving is very clearly predicated on, uh, or or is is much more correlated with a belief in God and a belief in a higher power. And furthermore, within I can't find anything that does better for human beings in Christianity and the Christian ethic. And then within Christianity, I can't find anything that does better within um, the. Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. So if you want to go through and argue and throw on the wall, as people like Jeremy Runnels do, where you just throw up every possible problem no, no, no. without no, examining wanna... what we're actually yeah. about and doing, is that we are seeking to follow Jesus Christ. Okay? So, and, um... and I can't find any group of leaders on earth that are more, uh, that are doing a better job of aligning yeah. people with Jesus Christ. I don't go to the prophets that's of the church for history. I go to the prophets of the church yeah. to learn the ways of life and salvation that Jesus Christ want me to know. And in that Even respect, Abbott says the same thing though. See, so I know again, they say the same thing, but the outcomes, if we go back to the epistemology that I talked about, the outcomes are demonstrably better. The rationale of Latter-day Saints is objectively better than that of Jehovah's witnesses. And, uh, and intuitively, I would say that I have received a witness from God. I truly believe that God has revealed to me that this is where I need to be and what to do. And can I, I can't, can I steal man I can't, you for a moment. I can't convey that. Go ahead. Yeah, can I, let me steal man you. That in spite of prophets being deeply hit or miss and often holding bad ideas for significant periods of time, multiple men, generation after generation, I still think they're prophets. In spite of Joseph Smith, as I agree, they are he is making up or adding in fictional story, which is which explains why the book oh, of Mormon. Are you, are the you book steel of Manning Moses. Hill? Are you steel Manning here? Because I because I want to go back to the, then. Can I correct something? Because there was a straw man in there. Okay, I, I do not agree with the premise that Please. the leaders of the church have gotten all these things wrong. I believe that they're fallible, but I believe on the issues that actually matter, on the issues related to the way to live my life in accordance with Jesus Christ, because I'm operating from that presupposition that Jesus Christ is the, or not the presupposition, but from the premise that Jesus Christ 
was who the New Testament claimed to be. I look at them to help me to live in accordance with Jesus Christ. And I don't believe that anyone out there does a better job of helping men and women to align with Jesus Christ than them. And Have so the Mormon standard by which I'm- been accurate on the Godhead throughout its history? Definitely Mormon, more so. Again, the, the important issue. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Adam God. I'll just okay. tell you ahead of time. Yeah, did Brigham was Mormon wrong about that. That's fine. Did Mormon pro do Mormon prophets have a consistent record of laying out exactly what the Godhead is, including Joseph Smith and like the lectures on faith or Brigham Young's teaching of Adam God? Do do the early leaders juxtapose yeah, I would against say, the I modern would say, leaders? I would say that our understanding of God, for the most part, has been better than any other group out there that puts it out. And it, it is more it is more rationally You're coherent. not answering my question, though. You're, you're, you're asking it. for it, but but what you're doing is you're trying to say that, hey, look, at all. there was a time where somebody had an idea that wasn't right, and therefore they're totally unreliable, right? Like I could do this with scientists, you know? If you look at the scientists historically, do, were they right about Apples and oranges. No, no, it isn't. Because yeah, this they, is the creator of the universe telling us that we shouldn't drink coffee, but seemingly struggling to tell Brigham Young what he and the rest of the Godhead was. That seems so fundamental to whether this is true or not. And it seems like you want to discard any moment where I show that Mormonism is irrational and I'll show it in 5,000 places. You want to kind of nod to it like, yeah, you're right, but doesn't matter. And no, it does matter. I'm no, no. What I'm saying, when, when I nod to the, the thing is, is you're just bringing up the things in the church that at times are, you're correct, that, that they got wrong or where they were fallible. Did Brigham Young get the Godhead wrong? Yeah, well, when it came to the Adam God theory, absolutely. Okay, I, I'm not. I'm not. Grant, I'm not super familiar with all of his theological teachings as to the nature of the Godhead. But there yeah. were uh, there were already apostles within the church that were saying that he had it wrong. Did and did so, the early leaders get free but, agency but wrong, or is the is, modern church getting moral agency wrong? Let's back this up. Okay, first of all, let's compare Latter Day Saints to general Christianity. Do we have a more rationally coherent? theology of God and the Godhead than do the Trinitarians. That that's your what you're suggesting is an opinion. And the only no. way we can evaluate the opinion is to go step by step, which we're not going to be able to do here. No, you can demonstrably step. show in a debate, as I've done with people, that the Trinity is a is a rationally inferior um is a rationally inferior explanation of God and the New Testament then is the Godhead as we present it. Didn't okay? the first edition of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's early theology hold a Trinitarian view? That's debatable. That's really debatable. We're going to have a whole debate right. about that. And frankly, I would say no. I so think it that, seems as though, late, again, most of the experts in this field would disagree with you that uh, if the you only... Just, if you just want to yeah. appeal to authority, that that's fine. I, I author, Reason, in my mind, trumps authority, okay? If a person makes a better rational argument, then I will go with reason over what the authority says because reason and my... An authority should be able to provide me with good reasons, yeah. okay? If they can't, then I'm not going to just blindly follow them. So the my point here is this, is that... If you want to do like you're doing right now and just put up a list of every possible question about Mormonism and say, is this rational? Is this rational? You can make a really good list. I don't deny that. But I also think I can make a big list of things that say, if you are a believing Christian, especially, and we go through this, does Mormonism make sense from that perspective? And it absolutely does. And especially if you ask the question, does it make more sense than all of the other worldviews that are out there available to someone who holds to New Testament Christianity? And I you, think that we have a very strong yeah. case, but it has to come from that premise. If you're just approaching it from an atheist perspective, say, hey, everybody, let's, 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 Let's deny that there's a God. Let's deny that Jesus Christ was who the New Testament makes him out to be. And let's just examine this from a, from a, um, a, materi a, 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 a materialist perspective, a metaphysical materialist perspective. Of course, you, you're taught, it's like you haven't crossed the first hurdle. You don't get to Joseph Smith until you've made sense of the other things and why those things 
are rational to believe. And that provides you with the premises upon which you can make the arguments for Joseph Smith. You're blending two sets of arguments to get, you've created your own flow chart that ends with the church being true, but you're not really dealing with these issues the way critical thinkers do. So again, I'll just establish, do no, I, is there I, I is, am, I just have different premises that I'm bringing to the table. Fine, Remember a I, critical I, thinker, I, the, yeah. the whole, the whole nature of the argument changes when you establish that there's a God and that Jesus Christ mm. suddenly I, you're critical thinking. Even if I agree to those, I still don't so think you, you think have a way to you, make it work. You think Aquinas was not a critical thinker. No, no, you're missing what I'm saying. You think so William Lane Craig is not a critical thinker. The thing no, is, no, no. there are critical thinkers. They're not Mormon, are they? You're right. But what I'm saying is, is that what, what I'm saying is, is in other words, they don't be, agree with you. I know, Bill. Yeah. What I'm saying, though, is that you can have people that are critical thinkers that can use reason to arrive at different conclusions, but it depends on the premises that you bring to the table. But you have My, to show your premises to be reasonable and rational. So again, Yes, again, it is reasonable and rational to believe that there is a God, and I will debate that with you. I'd be happy okay, to. But, but even that's where none our, of that that's leads to our, Mormonism for sure. Sure it does. It doesn't no. lead to it for sure, but I. it's very no, simple. It is more reasonable or rational to believe in God than not. It is more reasonable and rational, if you believe in God, to believe in Christ as the manifestation of that God than the alternatives. And then I would say that amongst Christian thought, that therefore from there, it is more rational to believe in the Joseph Smith narrative than the other narratives that are out there to explain okay. where Christianity is supposed to be today. You, you've made that point over and over. Let me Let me say that when I go into the collective history of the church, I find that Joseph's multiple translation productions, including because we've covered it, they have deep implications, the Kinderhook plates and the Greek Psalter. But aside from those, the book of Abraham, the book of Mormon, the book of Moses, the uh, Bible translation, um, all of those Come to buy into Mormonism, we have to buy that a very different mode of translation is happening in all of them. Some of them, it's a secular translation of some sort. Some of them, it's a catalyst theory. Some of them, it's an ancient record that Joseph's working with directly. We've created ways in which we tackle each problem isolated, but that when we look at the collective view, the most rational view is that Joseph wasn't translating at all even to the point where you agree. But hold on, hold on. Let me get it out. We could go through hundreds of statements of church leaders that show that they seem to be highly deceptive and dishonest about how they share and teach church history. See, Bill, and I have to disagree though, because I don't, I don't agree with those things. I don't agree that the church is highly deceptive and they do all these terrible things. What I think you're doing is you're selecting the things. This is where reason you, comes in. We can go you, through them. You're so right. You was, can take, if you take 150, if you take, if you take 150 years of history, you can find things that people have done wrong or that, it, or, or, Aren't or these serious though. Don't these point to a, an integrity issue among the leadership, for instance, no, SEC, not when you, not when you account for all of the rest of the data. See, the thing is, is bill, what you're doing wow. here is you've selected very narrow, particular data. What I'm saying is I've seen the data bill. I know the things you're talking about. What I'm saying is you're not considering the other things. You're not considering theism. You're not considering Christianity. No, I'm just dealing These with the integrity of the, the leaders right now. The, but, but here's the thing. The amount of data that's out there. With it, the integrity of the leaders. I mean, I could go to D. Michael Quinn, who is excommunicated, who, who I made a whole video on where he basically says, I'll look, tell the you church what. is finances. I've been doing this 10 years. Tell me uh -huh. three lies that I've told. I've been doing this work for 10 years. That. You've... <laughs> Bill, anybody, by the way, I haven't listened, in the comments I haven't on Jacob's I channel or here. I haven't listened because you know to why listeners. you're not going to find it. You're not going to find where I have intentionally lied three times. I'll, now, leave, that, find, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to the midnight Mormons to try and dig through your stuff and find. My stuff point is, if I'm more honest than church leadership over a 10 year span, any one of them, Elder Holland, double digit state creation every week of our lives, uh, Elder President Nelson with the plane story. You come on, you know that the plane story he highly embellished. You also know that the thing in Mozambique didn't happen the way he said, and he had to retract the book over the red hat. He's told more lies in the last whatever than I have in 10 years of doing this for sure.
Elder Holland, the same. These guys have an integrity issue, Jacob, and you want to make excuses for it, but it is demonstrable that Elder Oaks with the electroshock therapy, that was a dishonest. These guys don't want to tell the truth. So once I point out, if we let's use me. If I'm you real, real. And, and, I'm an and Mormon is, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with, with the things you're saying. These, the thing is you're throwing all sorts of mud against the wall. And unless we're going to get mm -hmm. into something specific, then let's, it's, let's it's too specific. But, the but, electroshock but, 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 therapy. Bill, Bill, oh, Bill, you just said it. I'm not, I'm not even aware. I'm not, I'm not totally versed on that, on that subject. So here's Elk. my thing. If we're going to discuss a particular subject, we have to delve into something particular. What you're doing in this you've podcast plenty is you're of throwing, subjects I haven't read enough about. You're, you're, throwing, you're choosing your own rules. You're playing. You're creating a rule book where you get to throw out things that I'm not versed in well, and I've sat with, and I go like, yeah, you're right there. And just look, Elder Oaks was at BYU as the president of BYU when when the electroshock therapy started. He claims that he, by the time he got there. It was gone. Is that true? Bill, Bill, I don't even know. I'm not familiar with that. My point is that you can sit there and nitpick every little thing with the leaders because of a of a of a deep disdain Let's pick for a Mormonism. One. Hold on, Bill. What I'm saying is, is that yeah. you're missing the point of the conversation. We're having a conversation. So their integrity about doesn't really matter. No, it does matter. But what but I'm saying is, is that is that these issues that seem so big can become much smaller when you take into account all of the data. What you've done is you're being very selective in the data that you present and you basically pick all of the bad things and then you line them all up. What needs to happen is there needs to be an analysis from the ground up, from God to Jesus Christ, then to the church. And at best, what you're doing here, just so you know, for yeah. me, is that you're convincing me that these guys aren't the prophets of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I don't think that you're right. I think you are totally wrong and I have lots of reasons why, but that's a separate discussion about the reliability of prophets. No, it's it's a what? it's a multifold problem, Jacob. If I can show that the integrity of the leaders is deeply questionable that the more rational answer is that these guys have no problem lying whenever it's convenient for them. If I can show that Joseph Smith's translation productions look like they're a 19th century production. If I can show that um, that there are many uh, paradoxes within Mormon yes, belief. Bill, that that's what with, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying is, is if you list off every possible little critique that you can no, no, have. These aren't little. The, these aren't little fine, at all. Fine, little and big critique, whatever. That's what anti-Mormons have been doing for forever, no, Bill. I, I know, that, but that's that, what that, anti-Jehovah's Witnesses are doing forever. Are that's what anti-Scientologists have been doing forever. Bill, that's a wood Bill. tool. What I'm saying is, is yes, I know. We know about these things. Yeah. Hammering them over and over doesn't do anything. No, no, no. Most what people don't is, know is, about is these that, things. Most believers is that, don't. Is that what, what needs to happen is that what we, we need to look at what do we believe in here, okay? And where is the disconnect, okay? I get it. You don't believe in Mormonism. You think they're unreliable. We know that. What I'm trying to go are to they is, unreliable though? Reason can show that they actually are unreliable. Let me give you an here. Are they? Give are they? Me, <laughs> the last fifty you, years. Yes, you can. You can make that on, case. I'm going to ask you an easy you're question. You can every it. quote that they have from all over time. I'm going to do something what different. What I'm saying though, Bill, is that yeah. is that in this conversation, okay, which was supposed to be about testimony, and we've gotten way off track. No, no, <laughs> it's actually a, it's a hundred percent about testimony because the way in which you get to the church is true is somehow to conflate and dismiss all of this. And I know you say like, you know it, but you don't actually want to confront it. No, no, Bill. Right, I'm let me ask of, you. I'm aware of all of it. What I'm saying though, it, it, the thing is, is if we want to, if you want to do a debate on, you know, is, uh, you know, is it, is it rational for a Christian to believe in Mormonism? Like, fine. We can like, that's a discussion to have. Let me ask a different but, question. But the thing is, is the that, last is 50 that, years, hold on, hold on. The last 50 years. What is the substantial revelation that the church has given that couldn't rationally be explained as a corporate business with 15 men at the top just doing their thing? And, and the 1978 revelation, by the way, I hope you don't use that one because they would essentially be being corrected on being wrong for 200 years. That would seem strange. But I would love to hear what in the last 50 years, what have Mormon prophets, seers, and revelators given us that couldn't rationally be explained otherwise so that I can overlook these problems and still see God's hand?
Well, I would say that a I would say that you're framing the question as rational according to your presuppositions that you bring to the table. So there's no answer I'm going to give you that would satisfy Please. you because you uh, you do you reject the idea that Forget Jesus. Me. Listen to the people. Okay. There's people oh, that are watching. Let's, let's do this. So let me let me do this then. Yeah. I would say if you're a Christian, okay, the church's revelation related to well, all of the church's revelations, I think, are are evidence that the church is connected to the Jesus Christ of the New Testament and doing his work. And I believe people can get a testimony of that as the New Testament describes by praying to God. But I would use the family proclamation as something wildly prophetic in the sense that it is going against the prevailing culture of our day, very much so. And it is true. It is it, when it came out in 19, I remember when the family proclamation came out, I was like, this is the most boring thing ever. Like, duh, like who doesn't believe this? And now all of a sudden, everything in it is controversial. And I believe that that was indeed prophetic. And I believe that the Lord was preparing us and giving to his people what we are willing to receive in order to stay aligned with what the biblical teachings and what Jesus teaches in relation to the nature of, uh, of, of family and gender. Yeah, so we can go into using rational thinking, look at the family proclamation, where we can see that it was used to create a friend of the court uh, amicus brief so that the church could then participate in the conversation about homosexuality. So, but let's set that one off to the side. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Family proclamation. Let's go. Let's go some more. Revelations from prophet seers and revelators over the last 50 years. The. <laughs> I'm not expecting there to be these wild new pronouncements oh, no, that are no. given by them. I believe Please. that the, I, I, well, why are we just going 50 years? Why don't we use the entire restoration of the church? Um, Things like the three degrees of glory, I think make way more sense. From Emmanuel do, Swedenborg, right? Again, rational thinking shows that those kinds of ideas already existed in Joseph Smith's milieu. So it's, it's gonna, regardless of what, what jo existed in Joseph Smith's milieu. The reality is, is that they make a much it, it, the 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 thing is is if it's true or not, okay? And and does so it if, and so does if it Jehovah's accord... Witnesses get something true because they yeah, take it's something true. from other sources and contemporary uh, uh, milieu of those leaders, then that makes them inspired. Bill, do you want to go and real quick? Can you pull up a slide that actually uh, it, it talks about this exact thing, right? Again, going back to epistemology. Um, if you go go to slide number. Um, I'm, I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to gather here that you realize that you sort of can't really name revelations that would indicate that these men actually talk to God in the last 50 years. No, I believe that they do have communion with God, just like Joseph Smith did and the others. I just don't believe that God is constantly revealing at the same rate to everyone all the time. I believe that there are things that God reveals and that he reveals it in different ways to different people. Joseph Smith was a very special prophet in it's our tradition tool. because he... <laughs> it is, right. though. You're making a reason that works with any church. Do you understand? Do you understand no, Jonathan Streeter's wood doesn't. tools and steel tools? I haven't watched the whole episode. I'd love so to So the idea is that. that when you come up with reasoning that would work within any church that keeps somebody going like, oh, yeah, Jacob answered it. I'm going to stay Mormon. The answers that you're giving just now would work inside any faith. So you have to come up with something unique because Mormonism is the true church and the rest of them are not. Real quick, pull up slide number 20. So I want to, this is a, this is something that Joseph Smith said. He said, the first and fundamental principle of our holy religion is that we believe that we have a right to embrace all and every item of truth without limitation or without being circumscribed or prohibited by the creeds or superstitious notions of men. If you go up to slide number 19, Brigham Young said, in a word, if Mormonism is not my life, I do not know that I have any. I do not understand anything else, for it embraces everything that comes within the range of the understanding of man. If it does not circumscribe everything that is in heaven and on earth, it is not what it purports to be. If you want to go up one more to slide 18. By the way, I know real quick, let, let's just, this, let's just, let's, I know, but doesn't actually real, do real, this. Real quick, please, please continue to go up. I'll, I'll get to, let me just finish the point real quick. 
President Nelson says, Dear brothers and sisters, God is the source of all truth. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints embraces all truth that God conveys to his children, whether learned in a scientific laboratory or received by direct revelation from him. So what I, my point here is that to say that we are the true church does not mean that other churches do not have truth in them or that there is not truth to be learned yeah, outside of, of it. Even it if is, Mormonism isn't true, it has some truth in it, sure. But But here's my point. So the fact that you're saying we're the one true church, what that means, Bill, is that we believe that we are the church that has the priesthood authority that Jesus Christ gave to his original apostles, and that through that authority, people can enter into covenant relationship with God. But again, to you, Bill, none of this makes any sense. You're just not in the same conversation no, because you don't accept you don't accept the you right. don't accept the presupposition of Christianity. That's fine. My whole point is, is that our disagreement is much deeper. And so if you're going to say, like, you're not going to see the evidences in favor of the church yeah. because you reject Christianity generally and theism generally. And the thing is, if you were to believe in God and in Jesus Christ, then suddenly there's a whole new world of possible evidences for you to consider, including the witness of the Spirit from God. And so if you reject the very possibility that God can talk to you, and you've already said, if God appeared in the room to you right now, you would you would believe that was a hallucination before you were to believe that That would be a reasonable, God. that'd be a reasonable option on the table. And I would have to examine whether, again, I would have to explore reasonably what could be or what couldn't be. I'm open. If an angel comes into the room right now, I'm open to that. But I'm also yeah, going what, to have doubts what, about it too. I'm going to be a skeptical. I'm going to trust, but verify. Yeah. And, but the thing is, there's nothing that you could do to verify that even if God himself appeared to you, that that wasn't a hallucination. Yeah. To a degree you're true, but there are ways in which you can weed out the obvious reasons for why it wouldn't be right. You, you're right. But, but what I'm saying is, is that there's something more fundamental going on here, Bill. In you, you have chosen particular values and you have chosen particular uh, ways of seeing the world that prevent you from being able to even see the things that we're that seeing. That goes both directions, so, Jacob. So, so I, and to some extent, I think that you're right in the sense that the presuppositions that we bring to the table, that everyone brings to the table, changes the way that they see the world. If you go back to that Stephen Covey slide, um, that is what he's saying. He's saying that you, Bill, are seeing the world as you are, right? And so the question is, is what is the way of being in the world that opens you to the most truth possible? And what I'm saying is, is that the Latter-day Saint conception of epistemology and of testimony and of taking in truth from wherever it comes allows us to see everything. But if you limit yourself as you have to the naturalistic materialistic view of reality as the only thing that constitutes reality. Of course, all of this absurd. And not only that, you can make big fat lists of things of why they're all wrong about this and that. And it totally seems unreasonable, but that's only because you're unable to see the other evidences, including the witness of God himself to you, that is even possible rationally, unless you embrace those other premises. So we're at 1232. Um, it seems as though we're kind of at the point where we're just bumping up against each other. And yeah, probably the so. best <laughs> thing to do is just to give each other a chance to give kind of a closing uh, thought of, of one side of the argument uh, without being interrupted. And yeah. uh, I, I, I'm happy to let you pick if you want me to go first or if you want to go first. Y you go ahead and go first. Okay. So in... Uh, the world of religious belief, there is lots of different institutions that claim to be the authority or have the truth within Christianity and outside of it. And when we talk about testimony, we're talking about testimony from, uh, from a Mormonism point of view, which requires at least on some level that you trust the emotional answers, at least as part of the formula, if not a significant part. And so for folks who are listening, who are open to having your mind changed one way or the other, whether you started off as a disbeliever or you started off as a believer and you really do want to get at what is true and what isn't, you need to recognize that there are believers 
inside of every spiritual system who have experiences that tell them that their spiritual system is true. So for instance, Jonathan Haidt, who Jacob Hansen brought up earlier, is the person who really expounded on the idea of elevation emotion. If you go to Wikipedia and you look up elevation emotion, it is described very similar, almost identical to the way that Mormon leaders uh, explain how the Holy Ghost tells someone that the church is true. And so all human beings feel these feelings of burnings in our bosom and hair standing up on our neck. And all of us feel uh, thoughts come into our mind about uh, peace and wanting to be more helpful in the world. So to arrive at whether Mormonism is true or not, you have to do something other than pray about it because lots of other people in lots of other spiritual systems are sure that they're right because they felt things after praying or after asking God. So what we have to do is we have to use critical thinking skills and we have to go into the system and see if its truth claims hold up. Mormonism has claimed a lot of things. It's claimed things about the apostasy. It's claimed things about, um, it's claimed things about the uh, uh, restoration. It's claimed things about translation. It's claimed things about uh, who Joseph Smith was, what his integrity was, who Brigham, Brigham Young was, how Brigham Young took over the church, for instance. Um, when you look at the integrity of leaders, and I would suggest folks, by the way, do me a favor, be open to changing your mind. Go on to mormondiscussionpodcast.org. In the top right uh, of the header, there is a link that says helpful resources. Go into the three documents I put there. And again, these three documents are the number of times the church has stated with certainty that it knew how God's kingdom worked, only to later disavow, reverse, dismiss, get away from those claims, which shows that Mormon prophets have some sort of barrier to getting it right. And often they don't get it right until the world forces them. Again, the lost and fallen world forces them to change. The second one is instances in which church leaders have been deceptive or dishonest. Go into that document and read all of those and begin to comprehend how far spread church leaders' dishonesty and deception goes. The third one is Mormon paradoxes. These are things that the church has claimed about how the church works, and which when you think about those problems logically, again, Jacob used to believe that the stripling warriors were real, and that that story was true. And it wasn't until his critical thinking mind told him that that story couldn't possibly be true, that it with a hundred other stories forced Jacob to retreat to some softer ground that no longer requires the Book of Mormon to be completely an ancient text. Those are called adding conjecture and inferences and allowances. And there comes a point where if you're going to be the true church of Jesus Christ upon the earth, a certain number of your claims have to hold up. And if you touch on those three documents and go through them, you recognize that the church being true is irrational, but you get to decide whether you still want to believe it or not. And you can't use emotional experiences to be the final straw for your testimony because Jonathan Haidt, who Jacob mentioned, already tells you that that's part of the human experience and can be manipulated anyway. And so there is a lot at stake. And if you were born into Mormonism and you're so sure that the church is true, what is the possibility that you're no different than the Jehovah's Witness or the Scientologist who's also born into their system, also sees all the same kinds of problems that I'm pointing out with Mormonism, and then does the same thing that Jacob's doing, which is go, yes, I agree there's problems, but in the end they don't matter. Um, if we start with the presupposition that God is real and Jesus is the Christ, then obviously the Jehovah's Witness Church is the best representation of his, of his faith. Once you do all that, if you can take a step back and recognize what other people in other systems frame their beliefs the exact same way, please uh, sense that you're making excuses for why you believe 
that don't don't actually actually deal deal with with the problems, problems, the absurdities, the reversals, or the integrity of one's leadership. Thank you. All right. Uh, Real quick, Bill, could you go to slide number seven, just so I I think that would be a helpful visual as I kind of wrap up here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so interesting. I so it, it's kind of tough here. And thanks, Bill, for for having me on. Uh, this discussion was originally supposed to be about testimony, ultimately. And um, Bill and I had kind of agreed, and we we're going to have these conversations that it wasn't supposed to be a debate. It was supposed to be a discussion where we kind of uh, ex- you know explore each other's points of view. Um, and one of the things is that I don't think Bill, Bill and I had any disagreement about how we come to know the nature of reality. However, uh, at least at least in the first part. But then in the second half of this, Bill basically was just asking over and over, you know, is this rational? Is this rational? Is this rational? Is this rational? But the problem is, is that Bill is basing what he thinks is rational on its reasonableness according to the premises that he brings to the table. As we discussed in the earlier part of this video, your reason is going to be changed based on the data that you take in. And because Bill has not taken in the data that God exists and that Jesus Christ is who the New Testament makes him out to be, of course the Joseph Smith story is not reasonable. It's not reasonable at all. It's kooky nonsense. Like, yeah, we know. But the thing is, is that we're Christians. We're theists. We're believers right? And we believe in God first. That's where we arose. And and I would say you can get there purely rationally. In fact, that's how I did. I do not presuppose God. I arrived at the belief that there is a God, that there is a higher power. And then I arrived at the belief utilizing these tools of outcomes, intuition, sense data, reason, authority, all of them. I use these in order to arrive at Christianity. And then once you arrive at Christianity, there's a set of premises that are there that then allow you to be able to evaluate Mormonism and actually see the evidences for it. The problem is, is Bill can make a big fat list of all of the evidences against the church, but he is unable to see or unwilling to see either because of biases or otherwise the evidence in favor of the church. And so what you have is you have a biased analysis that hasn't taken into account the premises that we've talked about as believers in God and Jesus Christ. The reality is that Bill and I have a difference of opinion, but it isn't at the level of Mormonism. And in fact, if G- if Bill were to believe in God and to believe in Jesus Christ, we could have a much more interesting conversation about Mormonism where Mormonism could be shown to be more reliable. That isn't to say that there aren't things that are problematic or challenging or evidences against our our belief system or things that they got wrong. Those generally are, they fit into the categories of either someone is fallible and they goofed up, or it's a misrepresentation by Bill where he's trying to expand something and to be something bigger than it is. But again, if we're going to pull the, let's just throw a million things against the wall, that's not a productive way of having the conversation. You have to get specific. And when we get specific, like into the issue of does God exist, where the actual disagreement is, that's where um, I think the interesting conversations can happen. And ultimately, what a person thinks is reasonable, okay, which is what Bill is coming down to, or rational, is based on the data that you put into it. Rationality is not the most fundamental, as Jonathan Haidt points out. It is a post hoc justification for your deeper intuitive senses. Bill and many like him have faced these very difficult um, uh, faith crises that have been an experience that has caused them to have an emotional reaction to the church. And it is because of this deeper intuitive uh, experience that they have within them that they then go and utilize the tools of reason against the church. But the tools of reason can be used in favor of the church as well, and you can make a very good case for it. Now, ultimately, making that case is its own thing. So in kind of closing here, Bill and I have have not had, this unfortunately sounds like a debate because we're both giving closing statements here. (laughs) Uh, In the future, though, you know, maybe we can actually debate some of these subjects because at the end of the day, we have fundamental disagreements. And it's very difficult to have a conversation about what you disagree about without it ultimately turning into where you're kind of debating it anyway. So um, yeah, just to sum up, when it comes to knowledge, 
Knowledge is ultimately about the witnesses that we allow in. I believe that, uh, as was said by our prophet, uh, uh, Joseph Smith, that we are allowed to embrace all items of truth. We don't need to close our eyes to our intuition, to outcomes, to sense data, to reason, or to authority. We can take in truth from wherever it comes. And I believe that if you follow the path, theism, you'll arrive at theism. I think that is where you arrive when you utilize these witnesses. Christianity is where you arrive if you're a theist. And I think if you're a Christian, I don't see any better alternative than what Joseph Smith brought to the table. And frankly, if someone else has something they want to bring to the table, well, then I'd love to hear about it. So anyway, that about wraps it up for me, Bill. Sweet. Thank you, Jacob. I didn't mean to put the comment up. I tried to take it off as fast as I could. I was clicking a button on my screen and it I know, you're all good. put one up there. Um, deeply appreciate your time. I, you know, I, this is so difficult because we're both so adamant about having a better perspective on how we're arriving at our conclusion than the other person. And I don't want it to be a debate. I really do want it to be that I understand where you're coming from. I, I think I do to a large degree, understand where you're coming from. Um, I don't, I don't, um, I, let me end this way. I deeply appreciate your time and grateful for this conversation. I hope that going forward, we can do a better job of listening to each other. I, I think there's moments where we're both not doing that. And, yeah. uh, and I Fair hope enough. that we continue to have these conversations. All righty. Well, thanks, Bill. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. It's going to take.